You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Wednesday, November 6th, 2024, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Kara Santa Maria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Good evening, everyone. Let's see what's going on in the world today. Oh, mm-hmm. I think it's a waxing <laughs> crescent moon out. Think so? um, it's warm. Think. It's very it's, warm. It's unseasonably it's, warm out there. Oh, and Connecticut has been uh, just beyond. 77. Yeah, 20 degrees above normal temperature. Oh, yeah, and Trump won the election. Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, I forgot like about that. that. Oh, Halloween happened. Halloween. And, uh, I didn't forget about that. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, thanks, had a, Thanksgiving had a coming up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, some things happened. So. Yeah, it was like a random assortment of miscellaneous stuff. So listen, you know, obviously we're recording this the day after the election. Trump, you know, we just found out, you know, whatever, half a day ago that Trump won. We're still processing it. This is a, a sort of a big thing to wrap your head around. We're not happy. We're not going to pretend we're happy. There's a great deal to be concerned about. He thinks global warming is a hoax. He wants to roll back anything you know, that we're doing about it. He's going to probably put an anti-vaxxer in charge of our health care. I mean, there's a lot to be concerned about, but we're not going to talk about the politics of this. Obviously, there's a lot of scientific and skeptical considerations that we'll be exploring this episode and in the future, but we're going to move on. So a lot actually happened. It's been two weeks since we've uh, recorded a show and we went to SciCon last weekend. That was a lot of fun. That was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a nice time. Skeptical events are always... Always recharging for me, like getting together. We got to see some of our old friends. I gave a talk on controversies within the skeptical group, things that skeptics disagree with each other about, because I think we should focus on that more at these conferences. We should be working out with each other, you know, in a positive, constructive way, the things that we disagree about, because while you still learn some stuff, it gets kind of boring talking about the stuff we all agree on over and over again. You know what I mean? And then there's this like big elephant in the room. Right, right. And everyone's like, right. don't yeah. talk about the thing we can't talk about. No, I was mm-hmm. like, I just talked about it. Oh, gosh. No. That's what you, that's when you should talk about exactly. it. Exactly. Absolutely. That was an amazing talk. The best one I've ever heard, Steve, that you've done, standing ovation. Well, well certainly the feedback. Accolades yeah, and tears afterwards by people. It was amazing to just experience. I, well, people were clearly hungry to address that issue, you know. Yes. It's oh, a, yeah. A, avoiding it is not the way to do it. Nope. Part of the talk was on the biological sex controversy. If you want to read about it, I actually blogged about it on Neurologica because there was a bit of disagreement, which again, I think is healthy and good, but you can read about that there. We'll probably be putting out a video at some point. SciCon will be putting out the just recordings of the talks uh, at some point. So I, I do think we you know need to explore these issues. And I think, you know, if we can, if, if, Hey, if there's a, if there's a group of people who should be able to disagree politely and constructively and focus on logic and evidence it's us right i mean yeah. if we can't do it who how can we expect anybody to do it? we have to practice what we preach you know what i'm saying i agree holy yeah holy absolutely agree. i mean it's look not gonna lie it's hard you know we've it's been, hard we've been doing this a long time we've been trying to teach people critical thinking and and sometimes the world doesn't bend the way that you'd like it to and it's quite and actually all used and it's good to remind ourselves of a lot of these things as well. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the themes as well. It was an exercise in humility. It's like, look, we disagree pretty much along political lines. As much as we like to pretend we are transpartisan or whatever, Ooh. we're not. You know, we are just as susceptible to ideological bias as anybody else. We just have to be more aware of it and confront mm-hmm. it. You know what I mean? That's the whole metacognition angle, not ignore it or pretend like, the other side is the only side that's ideologically biased and your side isn't, right. you know, but motivated reasoning is so powerful. I think that's one of the hardest things, even for seasoned, knowledgeable skeptics to deal with because we're good at it. We're good at motivated reasoning, ironically, because people who are able to argue in a sophisticated way and put forth a nuanced argument and have a lot of knowledge at their fingertips are actually better at, cog- at, um, at motivated reasoning. Mm-hmm. And they're more confident in it as well. Yeah. So that, yes, yeah, so we have to be very aware. That's like our big Achilles heel in the movement. We have to be very aware of it. Yeah. So that was no, fun. I think and, also kind of understanding, oftentimes we talk about causation and the directionality of causation. It's such an important part of science literacy. And I think we have to remember it when it comes to our own moral standings and our own decision making around things like policy, yeah. because very often 
we may think that something is a decision or an ideology that we came to via evidence when actually we came to it because, well, I agree with them about this. Why wouldn't I agree with them about that? Mm -hmm. You know, mm. is my position based on my investigation or am I open to somebody telling me what my position should be because eh, we're on the same team? Mm -hmm. That was one of the controversies I, I referred to is the idea, the question of can all even ethical and moral questions be resolved with science mm -hmm. or does it require philosophy and uh, morality and ethics, mm -hmm. you know, separate from science. Um, I tend to align myself with the philosophers in the movement on this yeah. issue. I've engaged with that dis discussion and I think the philosophers absolutely crush it you know, when they come up against the other people like, we don't need to do philosophy. Philosophy is irrelevant to science. Like, no, you're doing it. Whether you know it or not, you are yeah. doing it. You're just doing it wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then you guys went home and I went to uh, Dubai. <laughs> that was the first time in a, a, an Arabic country. It was uh, wow. a very, you know, it was a good experience. So Dubai is a very interesting city. It's very wealthy. It's an mm -hmm. international city. There was English everywhere. The only one touristy thing I did was like all, entirely in English. And, but there's this layer of Arabic Muslim culture there as well. So it's, it's kind of like you're in an alternate universe in a sci-fi movie. You know what I mean? Where everything's <laughs> the same but different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and I, I, gave a, I gave what turned, it turned out to be a nine-hour seminar on Jeez. scientific oh. skepticism. It's not a lot of time. It went by super fast. Really? I had I, the perfect audience because they were very smart, very engaged. They knew why they were there and they wanted something out of the conference. But this is all new to them. Oh, yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. So they asked tons of questions. Like every question was anticipating a future slide. It's like, that's a good question. We're going to get to that. Or let's talk about that. Or that, you know, and you realize when you're doing it, I didn't, I realized when I was writing it, but especially when I'm giving it, what a massive body of knowledge we have amassed under the umbrella of scientific skepticism. Oh, there yeah. is so much to talk about. Nine hours was nothing. It was Jeez. scratching I don't the know, surface. Man. I can't talk nine hours about anything, even if it was counting numbers, I couldn't do it. Uh, <laughs> well, Bob, I wasn't giving we a nine-hour lecture. You have to engage. It was asking questions. They were asking me questions. We were doing demonstrations. I did all the psychological stuff that we do. You know what I mean? It was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah. dynamic. The Socratic method. It wasn't me blabbering for nine hours. Trust Assuming me. you had breaks, too. Right? And there were breaks in there, yeah. <laughs> like each, it was three three-hour sessions with a break in the middle of each session. So I... I did uh, what I usually do at these longer, longer classes that I give. I, get, I gave a quiz that I've come up with, which is, <laughs> oh. which is you know, a quiz fo focusing on scientific literacy, critical thinking skills, media savvy, and just like belief in the paranormal, you know, kind of stuff. 30 questions. Um, they were able to like do the questions on their phones, and then I was able to t you know, like get Ooh. you know did it all in Google form, so you get like a chart pie chart of all the sure. answers. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. yeah. So then we went over Pockets. them at the end of the seminar, and it was a lot of fun. But what was really interesting is that they basically were average. They, they did their result. Their uh -huh. results were uh, aligned with a lot of published surveys about these questions. Like one of the questions was, "Did humans and non-avian dinosaurs live at the same time?" 60% of them got that question wrong. What? <gasps> oh. Yeah, yeah, so just, you, yeah you, like, mm. we're all science nerds, right? So like to the to us these questions are blazingly obvious, but to even well educated these are all like CEOs, very power, you know, very it's um high end yeah. high achieving business people, but they're not science nerds. So very few right. of them were. There's a couple engineers thrown in there. But and you just realize how you know how compartmentalized knowledge can be, you know. Yeah. Part of the whole theme of the talk was to be humbling. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, even you, you know, the whole idea, like, even though you might be very successful in one area, you don't know everything. No one's an expert in everything. And that was part of the demonstration, you know, of that. Of that. What fact. was the and name you, of your talk? you still you have a squat? brain. You still have a human brain. What's that, Bob? What was the name of the talk? You don't know squat? <laughs> no, it was just... Um, <laughs> Well, the whole theme of the conference was futurism, actually. So it was like oh, futurism. science, critical thinking in the future or something is what I called it. But I did a little futurism at the end as well, like from our book. Oh, damn. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was very good. Oh, so it wasn't specifically a skeptical conference. No, it, was, it wasn't. Hmm. It, it was really it – was, and it's month long. It was a month long conference where people were coming and going, you know. <laughs> And it was just a series of lectures and, and seminars and classes on a bunch of topics. 
the guy who is the dean of the Dubai Future Foundation, Muhammad Qasem, he's a big you know, fan of the show. He's been listening to us for years. He's the oh, one who, wow. who invited me there. And he like wants to inject skepticism into you know, the United Arab Emirates and the whole region, you know, not just the UAE, not just Dubai, but oh, like man, the whole, like into the whole culture. He, you know, it, we may all get invited there in the future. Like this is, he made it sound like this is the beginning of the, our relationship. You know what I mean? This is a sort of a building kind Love of thing. Love it. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's, that's why it's great to like, because we've obviously been operating within our own culture for 30 years. It's nice to go somewhere else that where like there. Is there isn't, you know, an organized right. skeptical movement. Like, it's yeah. just sure. virgin territory. It's like, oh, my God. I could be packed in 20 minutes. It's just, yeah. Just <laughs> it's a 15-hour flight, just warning you. But Bob, you have to talk for nine hours about something. Yeah. <laughs> but the food, One, two, the food three. was incredible. I'm a fan Ooh. of Middle Eastern food. Yeah. Not as if that's a monolithic thing. It's a thing. It's like I had Iraqi food. Never had Iraqi food before. It was Middle Eastern food, same spice palette, same kind of vibe. But it was different. It was everything was was just oh, cool. this, nothing I've ever had before. It was awesome. It was incredible. Anyway, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I hope I'm, I expect we will be uh, we'll be going there sometime in the future. Just please, not October. <laughs> <laughs> no promises. <laughs> but again, it, and it was uh, it was really interesting how similar it was. Like I had conversations with people who were you know like a, from the UAE. I talked to somebody who was heavily involved in the power industry. You know. I could have been talking to somebody here. It was really no different. They had all the same issues, all the same information, you know, as far as that was concerned, pretty much the same attitudes. I was kind of surprised, but it was interesting how similar uh, things were. But I think that's because it's an international city. And also they are looking to, I think they're looking to like elevate the UAE as a modern technological sort of state and Dubai as, a, as an international modern city. So they're very interested in uh, in that sort of thing. Hey, George is here. George, how you doing, man? George. Hi, everybody. Hey, George. What's going on? What's going on? Do you Are you as excited as I am for December to like get here? Can we get the holidays happening? Can we get the vibe of the holidays, let's please, go. happening? <laughs> I, I think let's, we need to celebrate Pearl Harbor Day with a special event or two. Uh, ooh. <laughs> Perfect. So we've got this monster day, December 7th, in Washington, D.C., of all places. Are you ready for it? I, I hope you're oh, ready I'm for ready. it. I hope, I hope, We're ready. I hope Steve and I are uh, working on supplementing swag. the SGU swag stuff. So if nice. you're going to be oh, there, in, the, the best and pretty much only time that you're going to get good SGU swag is if you come to a live event because we bring all the <laughs> premium stuff. George, the question is, are you excited? We rarely do a big double day, a double show in one day like this. And what's so great about doing both a private show earlier in the day and then doing the extravaganza at night is we get so wonked out, giddy, funny, silly, <laughs> almost like yeah. like skeptic, skeptic drunk yeah. by the end of it. It's, it's a long day. And those are the best shows. <laughs> so if you're going to go to one show this year, go to the extravaganza, go to the private show that's happening on the 7th because it's going to be this marathon day. It is such a blast. And- What's super cool is this is one of our very special holiday-themed extravaganza shows. We've only done this one other time. I think it was in Arizona, right? Mm-hmm. I think, yeah. Yes. Yep. During that Arizona show, we had the famous Yukon Cornelius incident. Do you remember that? Of course I do. <laughs> oh, my gosh. One of the biggest crazy. laughs of all time. Ask us about that sometime. If you see us, ask us. We'll tell you in D.C. about the Yukon Cornelius incident that happened in Arizona. It was fantastic. We'll try to recreate that on some level. And but, it's uh, also t- important to uh, say, guys, that the private show is a private show plus, which means there's an extra hour of content. Basically, we do audience interaction. It's different every time. Yeah, we, we've done a, we did a scavenger hunt once. We did a bunch of trivia things once. We did like some song stuff once. Every time it's different. Every time it's special. So even if you've done this before, Come to it again because it's guaranteed to be different. Same thing with the extravaganzas. Every extravaganza, the framework is the same, but there's so much improv and incidental stuff that happens. Every show is different. We literally had people going to two shows in a row when we did this back mm-hmm. a couple months ago, and they they fully enjoyed both shows. I love doing I love doing those shows because we've had lo- weekends where we've done like f- six shows in three days. Like we've we've had some pretty serious tours that we've been on. 
but I really like it when the all of us have to like really work together to make it all happen. And it, it's such a feel good when we when we do the shows and we finish them. It's like, oh my god, guys, it was so awesome, right? And then we get to see we get to see everybody. You know, for the, most of our lives, we're sitting here talking to microphones in our basements. So it's kind of nice to see people's faces and hear everybody laugh and interact and enjoy themselves. There's a lot of audience participation that happens at the extravaganza as well as the private show. So come on out. Uh, it's it, Talk about a great gift mm -hmm. for someone who likes the show. I mean, could you think of a better present? And George, everyone should know that you are one funny bastard. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes. true. I, I, I just had my license renewed. Yeah, so. yeah. funny good. bastard license renewed. Good. That's good. My funny <laughs> bastard license renewed, freshened. I got the new, the new test taken for that. So yeah, mm -hmm. all good. No, we're excited. I'm excited. I hope you guys are uh, as excited as I am because that means that you'll be equally as excited. And then the equation's all <laughs> even and good. Go to theskepticsguide.org. And uh, Ian has put these special buttons on there that you can click. And if you're interested in either show, you just click the button that you like. And also, don't forget, I do think there's some VIP tickets left for the extravaganza. Ooh. And also, let's not, while we have George on, Let's let's plug one more thing because it's actually a, a huge deal. Nauticon? Yes. We have Nauticon coming up. This is <gasps> yes, the weekend of May 15th. It's going to be in White Plains, New York. And let me tell you, we had a goddamn awesome time. It was epic. Fabulous time. It really was Fabulous. the best conference I've ever been to and it was the best conference I was involved with. And real quick, I must have said this story, but I'll just say it really quick. There was this one guy that came up to us and said, you know, I came here. I didn't have any friends. I didn't know anyone. I was almost not going to come. And I said, what the hell? I got to force myself to do it. And we have a, uh, a, a an event-wide puzzle that you have to live through the entire event to be able to figure out the entirety of this puzzle. And he, like, picks up the puzzle sheet and he said, the next thing you know, I'm sitting down with like six people I don't know and we're hanging out like we're friends. And that was it. He was bingo. Like, bingo. Yeah. He, he was hooked in. And the that, magic of not a con. But isn't that what we saw, guys? I mean, you know, we yeah. we've known for a very long time that we've curated a, an amazing group of of listeners and patrons. But this group of people, man, I got to tell you, like, I feel like I, I have a lot of friendships with, with the people that come and there's a lot of love and a lot of affection and a lot of awesome stuff. So if you're interested to come have a great time, you know, this conference is about socializing. Um, if you're interested, you can go to not a con con dot com. Remember, George, that Ian made this weird URL? Not a con con dot com. Not a con con. Check a con con. Check a con. Or you go to our homepage and just click on the not a con button. Yeah, there's a not a con button there. Not, yeah. not a con too skeptical mystery. And tour. George, what's happening oh, at Not a Con this year? My God, what's happening I, at special? I can't even keep track of it. We have so many fantastic ideas happening. We got this kind of Beatles theme that's going through. We might have like a special super game show, another game show, more audience participation. We're going to have uh, SG University where you get to learn stuff in 15 minute chunks from all these experts on stage. It's just overwhelmingly cool. But the most important thing is like you just said, Jay, you get to hang. We we if we've we've built it in so that there is this time to just meet and greet and hang and talk about stuff and have that very wonderful beer that that Westchester's famous for. It's just it's just the best. It's the best time. Well, George, thank you for popping in. Thanks. I'll pop in any time. Yep. I'm gonna go pop out now. And we'll and see you on myself. the other side, friend. Alrighty. Bye All guys. Right. Hey, George. Right. While we were at um SciCon, we actually did a number of interviews. We have a really great interview coming up later in this episode with Brian Cox. Oh, yeah. The Brian Cox. Brian Cox. And Brian Wecht, who is our friend and you know collaborator on Nauticon and other things, who's also the happens Brian to Wecht. be the Brian Wecht, happens to also be a <laughs> physicist and a ninja and an actual ninja. Then don't even ask. Because right? we can't. Yeah. Tell you. <laughs> he, uh, he was there for the interview and made it extra special. He was the special sauce. Um, so he's out be later in the show. But now we're going to go on with uh, our new items. Bob, you're going to start us off with a quickie. Sure. Thank you, Steve. This is your quickie with Bob. So an international team of scientists have actually determined the chemical properties of some super heavy elements, Moscovium, element 115, and Nihonium, element 113. So this makes Moscovium the heaviest element ever chemically studied. And you might be thinking... How the hell do they test an element chemically if that element lasts for milliseconds before decaying? Very good question. So that's what I'm going to describe. The lab setup was very slick. Essentially, they create super heavy particles. And using gas chromatography, they quickly kind of shuttle those elements through various detectors that are lined with quartz and gold. Now, if the element 
say Moscovium, if it binds with the quartz or the gold, that is detected and recorded, as well as how long it binds with, with that with the gold or the quartz and where and where that super heavy element ends up. So that binding information is invaluable data as to how these elements behave chemically. Now they found generally the results said that both super heavy elements, muscovium and nihonium, they had weak interactions with quartz. And this actually lines up with their predictions. So here's where it gets really interesting. I wasn't aware of this. Uh, They predicted that relativistic effects would make super heavy elements less reactive than similar elements on the periodic table with fewer protons, say like lead. Uh, For various reasons, they think lead and muscovium should behave similarly in how it binds with quartz and gold, for example. And it didn't. The muscovium did not react did not bind as well, and that was predicted. Um, so it's believed that the relativistic effects come to play with super heavy elements because they have more protons. All right, so imagine that you've got a, you've got a super heavy element with 115 protons. There's so many protons in the nucleus now that increases the electromagnetic forces uh, that are available that are in play in the nucleus, and that alters the electron the electrons in the atom. Now, classically, if you look at this classically, you could say that. Um, the electrons get closer to the protons because the, the electromagnetic force is stronger, and that makes them move at speeds closer to the speed of light. And doing that, you're gaining mass. Now, you can look at it quantum mechanically. You can look at it as the electron cloud around the atom becoming distorted because of the stronger electromagnetic forces because of the protons, right? You with me? So either way you look at it, whether you look at it classically or quantum mechanically, the super heavy elements should change how they interact with other elements chemically. And that's exactly what they showed with this experiment. This, these relativistic effects come into play with, with these super heavy elements, causing them to behave differently chemically. And that's exactly what, this, what they showed. So sure, this doesn't mean that we're going to add muscovium or nihonium to the iPhone 20. But understanding the chemical properties of super heavy elements could lead to breakthroughs in material science and other fields. Who knows what kind of interesting breakthroughs could happen with a deeper understanding of relativistic effects influencing super heavy elements. So this has been your relativistic super heavy quickie with Bob. Back to you, Steve. Thank you, Bob. Jay, give us the first news item. You're going to tell us about the Biogenome Project. What is that? All right. This is awesome, guys. The Earth Biogenome Project. It's also called EBP. This is a really amazing effort. They started it in 2017, and their goal is to sequence the genomes of all 1.67 million named eukaryotic species. There's 8.7 known species, but they're just talking about the ones that are currently named. This encompasses, ready, plants, animals, fungi, and other microbes. So the eukaryotic organisms include, let me give you the bigger list. There's animals, plants, fungi, and protists encompassing all multicellular life and some unicellular species. So basically, Jay, that's everything but... Bacteria and archaea. Exactly. That That's exactly. Is there anything it. else like it's like algae, single cell, prokaryotic? They, they, it depends on the type of algae. Blue green, blue green algae is not. So there's some of each. Okay. Well, guys, they they specifically are distinguishing eukaryotes from simpler, you know, the non nucleated. Yeah, yeah. Prokaryotic, prokaryotic organisms prokaryotes, like yeah. bacteria. So I think I think we define that pretty good. So the project scale. Literally, it, it, it's so massive, bigger than earlier efforts that have come before it, like the Human Genome Project. And, you know, that was a cool thing that they did. That project, uh, it focused on mapping a single species genome, so the human species, right? The Earth Biogenome Project's ultimate goal is to revolutionize this understanding that of all, all the Earth's biodiversity, which will improve conservation strategies. It'll drive advancement in agriculture and human health. So there's three phases. It's structured. The first phase is uh, in 2026. They want to sequence 10,000 species. This should be covering uh, one representative per eukaryotic family. Then phase two, 2030 is the, is the end date. They want to expand that to 150,000 genomes, which includes one for each genus. And then by phase three, which is 2032, they want to complete the genomes for all 1.67 million named species. It's huge. Absolutely. But they have a plan. So let's go into that. They don't have an idea or a concept. They actually have a plan. (laughs) So far, the EBP, right? Remember I told you that's what they call it. They've sequenced 3,000 genomes from 1,060 families. And this covers a lot of work, but that's far 
from its phase one target, and the initial cost estimates for phase one were over six hundred million. But they were able to reduce that to two hundred and sixty five million because why, guys? AI. That's a great idea, <laughs> but that wasn't it. Oh, because of so rapid sick. advancements in sequencing technology. And again, keep in mind, like sequencing technology is constantly being improved on as the years go by. It's been in a constant state of flux, which is awesome because look at that price difference, 600 million to 265. So by comparison, the Human Genome Project's first draft of their genome project cost over $100 million. But again, keep in mind, the Human Genome Project work on one species. The EBP is going to work on 1.6 somewhat more, you know, 1.6 million. That's so much more. It's ridiculous. So despite the investments, the EBP's progress needs to happen faster than it currently is. And they're trying to figure out how they're going to do it. So what they want to do is they want the weekly genome production to scale from 20 to 721 by phase two. And and they've scoped it out that that'll meet um, their deadlines. So unlike its predecessors, EBP is a decentralized global project. This is great. It involves affiliates from 28 countries. Two major hubs are BGI in China and the Welcome Sanger Institute in the UK. So the project needs regions that have massive biodiversity to get funds to keep the the project moving forward. So the problem is, is that a lot of these places that have a huge biodiversity, they just don't have enough money to make it all happen. Some regions have funding. They have these funding issues, but the people behind the EBP came up with a solution to help them out. And this is a great idea. They developed a portable sequencing lab they call G-Boxes. And I could not find anything on why they call it G-Boxes. So these labs, you know, they can be deployed wherever they need to. Um, Each unit costs approximately $5.5 million to install and operate over a three-year period, and they can sequence between 1,000 and 3,000 genomes annually. And they can just pump these, the, you know, these G-boxes out where they need to go, and they're relatively you know, inexpensive, all things considered. So the funding has been ongoing, and it's been a huge challenge for them. You know, right now, guys, as everybody knows, there's geopolitical tensions, um, and they get in the way, and it really matters when countries don't agree and don't have good relations with each other, you know, science basically suffers a lot, um, and particularly between the U.S. and China. And you'd think, you know, why can't they just talk and fix it? But they can't because we can't even agree and, you know, each country can't even agree on what's going on. Even partial success here would still be awesome, you know, if they don't actually get all the way and, and they're actually describing it as transformative. You know, a high quality reference genomes could do lots of things. It could accelerate conservation efforts for endangered species. It could identify genes critical for crop resistance, as an example, or it can improve our understanding of ecosystem dynamics. There's a lot, a lot to this. It's not just getting the information, but there are applications there that they know of. So as it stands, EBP right now, it's the most ambitious genome initiative in history. And if it's fully successful, it'll mark a new era in science which is offering insights into intricate tapestry of life on Earth. You know, great. It sounds great. But really, they're saying we're going to basically have a backup of the genome of all these named species, and it will be the foundation for lots of future solutions and global challenges that are coming up, right? Because if we want to save species, we can understand, you know, what their needs are better. And if we lose the species, we might someday be able to bring it back, which would be great. So even in the project's early stages, uh, the project does demonstrate I would consider it to be extraordinary potential and and a hugely collaborative workspace for for science on a planetary scale. You know that's the exact environment that science I think is best when there's tons of people involved globally and it, and it's something that's happening all over. Yeah, I mean the cool thing is like essentially this will give us a map of all living things like at the at the genetic level, and we get to start we can start asking really interesting questions evolutionarily and otherwise. You know, it's just a massive data set. And imagine that we sick AI after it to try to find sick him. patterns and stuff. Yeah, in in that vast data, that's cool. absolutely. I mean, you would think this would be something that would have hopefully already been done, but it's still incredibly laborious. It's very hard with today's technology. But you know, this type of science actually drives innovation as well. So it's really good when, for example, I just read a cool statistic that like NASA, you know, in 2022, NASA brought tens of billions of dollars of industry by its inventions and everything that it, the, all the science that they're doing, like it's really valuable downstream when you know they ha- literally hand over the technology that they're creating to companies in the United States. So bottom line is I, you know, I'm 100% behind this project. I think it's wonderful. It's the exact type of science that needs to be funded globally. And I can't wait to hear that, you know, that bell ring when they finish. 
Jay, let me ask you one more question. Yo. Does the sun have a magnetic field? It's got to. Of course it does. Yeah, it does. Um, how strong is it? It's, Steve, it's, oh. it's, it's wicked strong, yeah? Yeah, it's wicked? like a yeah, it's, 18 slash 23 in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the strongest force I would imagine in, in the galaxy, no? <laughs> right. it, it's it, extends, super strong. it extends past Pluto. I mean, it's big. It's big. It's actually, it's very variable. So the Earth's magnetic field at basically the Earth's surface is one Gauss. It's point six Gauss. Oh, yeah, not even one. Not, okay. The Sun's mag. The average magnetic field of the Sun at its surface is one Gauss. So just ah. slightly stronger. Average strength around one Gauss, but it's highly variable with sunspots being the strongest. That's why the, I think that's what sunspots are. You can get the, sunspots can reach magnetic field strengths of 2,000 to 3,000 Gauss. That's attractive. That's huge, right? Yeah. Yeah. You've, uh, got, yeah, you've got very powerful magnetic effects like reconnection happening that can unleash yeah. v- very powerful. Now, it's, very, it's a very big magnetic field. It's bigger than Earth's magnetic field, but it still decreases with distance. So at the Earth, how strong do you think the sun's magnetic field is at the Earth's distance? Probably pretty weak because it's pretty weak. Mag- it's, it's 50 it's... microgauss. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Five, wow. Five, One five hundred thousandth? It's a, One yeah, a micro millionth. is a million. So 50 millionths oh, of five, a gauss. 50 million. Or five micro tesla. I guess the Tesla is 10 Gauss. Well, that's barely detectable, right? Yep. What about at Pluto? Oh, it has to be. Nano uh, Gauss. I mean, really? Yeah, 2.2 2 nano Tesla. Got it. Oh, Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got nano right. Yeah. Uh, or, so what would that be? I would be, or, 20, or 2 nano Gauss. Ah, still right. Yeah. Awesome. What what does that even do at that? It's limit? negligible, it's right? That's right. basically yeah. negligible. I don't even know if we it's can measure basically anything. calculating it. But it, it still keeps out the um, the interstellar medium, the to infamous some, to ISM. some extent. Yeah. To some, oh yeah, it, 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 it defines yeah. the boundary until you get of to the helio our solar pause, system. Right? Yeah. yeah, and helio shock and all the helio sheath and all that other stuff. Now the question is: Has this always been the case, or has the in the past, especially the distant past? especially the very early solar system, was the, mag- the sun's magnetic field stronger? I'd say much stronger. Aren't there a lot – don't some young stars have – are very kind of chaotic? Like are they, were they like wolf Rayford stars? Yeah. How could we answer that question, do you think? Well, we – What time machine? Know? You know, time machine would do <laughs> Yeah, that'll um, do. It's at the amount Look of, at other stars. The amount of elements look at other stars. Uh, present in the current uh, star versus the – what we estimate was in the early star. Or we could measure it. Huh? From we, other stars. No. Because – Through telescopes. Looking. How do we know – what the Earth's magnetic field was in the past. Oh, you look at like fossilized like magnetic rocks. Ice. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. Right. Or, or the water samples. No water. You're looking for rocks that have yeah. elements that will align themselves to a magnetic yeah. field, and you basically you dealign them, and the, however much energy you have to put in to dealign them is how much energy was put in to align them. Basically, I think this is how it works. So then we could say that well, that's how strong the magnetic field was when this thing crystallized, right? When this formed. So how could we get rocks from four billion years ago? Oh, asteroids. Asteroids, yeah. exactly. Meteors. Asteroids and meteors. So for meteors that hit the Earth, basically those are going to tell us about the magnetic field of the inner solar system because most of the meteors that are going to land on the Earth probably formed in the inner solar system. And we have done that. But if we could get an asteroid from the outer solar system, then we could get a measure of the magnetic field, you know, when that asteroid formed, probably 4 billion years ago, whatever, 4.6 billion years ago, in the outer solar system. So this is what was just done. You, do you guys remember Ryugu, the Japanese? Yeah. Oh, it, yes. Yeah. It went and landed on an asteroid and took a sample. So, so the asteroid was Ryugu, right? We talked about this, I think, when, when they recovered mm-hmm. it and they got the, the grains from... Right. Just like we, we talked about Bennu was the... NASA project. This was the Japanese one. So they they recently a team analyzed particles from Ryugu uh, for signs of an ancient magnetic field in the outer solar system, and they what they found was nothing. Right? They didn't. They found no evidence of a magnetic field. But what they said, what this means is, given the techniques that they used, 
they can only say that there's an upper limit to right. how strong the magnetic field could have been, and that's 15 microtesla. So there, if there was a magnetic field in the outer, so past Jupiter, when, we, when I say outer souls, I'm talking about past Jupiter. If there was a magnetic field beyond Jupiter, it would have been um, at you know basically where that asteroid formed, it would have been less than 15 microtesla, hmm. which is not negligible. It's small, but it's not negligible. It's not in the nanotesla range. And what, I, what do I mean by not negligible? Something very specific here. Because one of the questions was, what was the impact of the sun's magnetic field in the formation of planets and other objects circling the sun? They analyzed other data, and the researchers concluded that there may have been a, a um, other data basically indicated that there was a five microtesla magnetic field in the outer solar system, which fits with the, it had to be less than 15 microtesla. So this is not completely confirmed. They are hoping to get the same analysis from the material brought back by asteroid Bennu and to see if they can confirm that. But the data that we have so far is kind of lining up to there was probably a weak magnetic field, but not in significant magnetic field in the outer solar system. So what, do, what effect does the magnetic field have on the formation of the solar system. You know, when the solar system condenses out of a cloud of gas, like it becomes a, basically a spinning disk, the sun forms it in the middle, and you have a cloud of ionized gas, like a disk of ionized gas surrounding the sun. It's ionized, so it responds to a magnetic field. Yeah, yeah. The thinking is that in the inner solar system, that magnetic field, the sun's magnetic field, would have caused clumping to occur, which probably formed into the inner rocky planets. And so the question was, could the same process have been happening for the outer planets and even other stuff out there? And this, so this is sort of moving in that direction saying, yeah, it's, oh. it could have, you know, there, if there was this five microtesla or whatever field out there, um, it was probably 50 to 200 microtesla in the inner solar system. If it was like five or whatever, microtesla in the outer solar system, that could have contributed to the formation of the gas giants. And, and, and basically everything condensed into like asteroids and comets and stuff past Jupiter. Uh, so that's why they're so interested in this question, you know, because it affects their models of early planetary formation, right, in the early solar system. Mm. Yeah. So the next step, I think, is going to be doing the same analysis of particles from Bennu to see if that also lines up with the, maybe they can get a more precise number or confirm it, that there is, what well, there was like a five microtesla magnetic field in the outer solar system at that time. So that's pretty cool. Nice. All right, Kara, we're going to go in a bit of a different direction here. Tell us about <laughs> the possibility of RFK being in charge of our health. Oh, geez. RFK Jr., oh, I should say. wow. RFK Jr., who... Trump has publicly verbalized he plans to put into a, quote, position of power. Actually, I guess the real quote was to go wild on health. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think that's actually what he said. And possibly, quote, declare war on the FDA. He's a proponent of this sort of newly dubbed health freedom movement or what some are calling MAHA, Make America Healthy Again, when he suspended his campaign for the presidency in August of this year and backed Donald Trump, he promised to make him uh, to give him a big position. He hasn't verbalized or he hasn't specified what that position might be heading up health policy. You know, some have speculated positions with the FDA or the CDC, although those require approval, like congressional approval, whereas Let's see, the Secretary of Health and Human Services or possibly a czar role, I think would be possibly easier to put him into. Yeah, it wouldn't require approval. Yeah. You could just appoint him. You're the health czar and that's it. You're the czar and now you right, do the which things. is like his personal advisor yeah. in a way. Right. To, to and, the president. And so a lot of people that are writing about this are showing a tweet. I mean, there's so much data to mine here. There's so much evidence of what will happen that this is not crystal balling. This is just saying, well, this is what the dude said he was going to do. But here is a tweet from RFK Jr., Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who quickly, like, I guess for those of you who don't know who he is, he is 
he is an environmental lawyer and actually has a very long track record of sort of working to protect vulnerable people against um, environmental disaster. But also, he's a hardcore anti-vaccine activist. And I love that according to his Wikipedia page, he's an environmental lawyer, American politician, anti-vaccine activist and conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. Just right there in the first line. So he founded the Children's Health Defense, which is an anti-vax group. They're one of the biggest peddlers of uh, COVID-19 vaccine misinformation. Obviously, he tried. He attempted to run for president and he is a Kennedy. So he's the son of Robert F. Kennedy and he's the nephew of JFK and Ted Kennedy. Back to the tweet here. So this was October 25th, 2024. So only about a week ago, two weeks ago. FDA's war on public health is about to end. This includes its aggressive suppression of psychedelics, peptides, stem cells, raw milk, hyperbaric therapies, chelating compounds, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, vitamins, clean foods, sunshine, exercise, nutraceuticals, and anything else that advances human health and can't be patented by pharma. At you last. For, at last. You will be able to use sunshine without the FDA's <laughs> interference. If you work for the FDA and are part of this corrupt system, I have two messages for you. One, preserve your records. And two, pack your bags. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay. So uh, David Gorski describes this as an extinction level event for science based federal health policy. Ouch. Yeah, that's in the headline of of a very long piece that he wrote (laughs) about how dangerous this would be. Um, And he, of course, wrote it the day before the election. Um, So let's kind of talk for a second about some of the things that RFK Jr. wants to see changed. A lot of people are focusing on fluoride. I think we'll come back to fluoride because, Steve, you you wrote a piece about fluoride. Yeah, because Um, of this, yeah. Because of this, exactly. But there, there are other things that have been highlighted across the board that are problematic. Obviously, he is one of the biggest anti-vaccine voices out there. Um, the New York Times did a post where they sort of dug deep into whether or like, can he actually affect real change here? Like, could Trump ban vaccines, for example? And what the New York Times, what this article at least is saying is that, you know, the short answer is no, because public health in the U.S. is mostly controlled by the states, not the federal government. And then where there is federal um, kind of oversight, that's with the FDA. They license the vaccines and the president can't just remove a product that's lawful and licensed from the market, at least not without like trying to do so through legal maneuvering. But the president could put pressure on the FDA. The president could make sure that the judges that are appointed limit the power of federal agencies. We also know that he, before he left office last time, where he changed the the, um, classification of a lot of federal agencies. Yeah, I forget Uh, the name of the order, but yeah. Yeah, federal employees so that they could be um, let go um, and their jobs were not protected. And so he passed this before he left office last time, like week one, Biden reversed that. But it's very likely that he's just going to dive right back in once he takes office. So yes, there could be a lot of change here. One person is quoted in this article saying, there's a lot of mischief that can be done, but a flat out ban, no. But they could, you know, pull funding if anybody mm-hmm. doesn't follow their their mm-hmm. dictates. Mm-hmm. That's how the federal and they government could works. Put a lot the, of can, the state pressure. controls it, but the federal government could just pull funding. Yes, exactly. Affordable Care Act, you know, recently, and I think that this was in a in a final bid to get elected. Trump kind of pulled back a little bit on his rhetoric around the Affordable Care Act and said that he like never mentioned ending the program. He never would have thought about such a thing. But there's a lot of like he's on tape, you know, saying that he did want to appeal Obamacare or the ACA. As we know, that actually requires an act of Congress, but he could use executive uh, power to undercut the law or to restrict access to the law. And this article really details a lot of the ways that he would be able to do that. 
So like, for example, in January of 2021, Biden issued an executive order that strengthened Medicaid and the ACA, and Trump could just undo that as soon as he's in office. Mm -hmm. Um, And then if Congress were to repeal the act, what would come next? Well, going back to what you said, Jay, well, there's concepts of a plan. Yeah, they have no idea. They they got nothing. They got nothing. There is nothing. There's only so many levers you could pull there. You know, that's... There's no magic right. here, you know? And so then we're going to backtrack a little bit to fluoride, but I did want to point out a friend of the show, Dr. Andrea Love, she has a blog called Immunologic, and she wrote a piece back in September about the Congressional American Health and Nutrition Roundtable. The headline of her article is, The Congressional American Health and Nutrition Roundtable was an egregious display of anti-science disinformation. So basically what happened is that on Monday, September 23rd, a GOP senator for Wisconsin, Ron Johnson, hosted a public taxpayer dollar funded event where he put together what he claimed to be a panel of, quote, experts who will provide a foundational and historical understanding of the changes that have occurred over the last century within public sanitation, agriculture, food processing, and healthcare industries which impact the current state of national health, end quote. But what really he put together was a panel including, I'm going to list some names, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Jordan Peterson, Michaela Fuller, Casey and Callie Means, Vanny Hari, Max Lugavier, Courtney Swan, oh, Marty Macri, Alex Clark, Jason Karp, Brigham Bueller, and even more scrolling, scrolling, Jillian Michaels, Chris Palmer, and Grace Price, none of whom have any expertise relevant to what this panel is supposed to cover. They're all a bunch of quacks and shirts. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the food, that's food the, babe. The, the food babe, yeah, right? All of yeah. whom are notorious anti science quacks. Yeah. You know, they all peddle misinformation. And not only do they peddle misinformation, the vast majority of them benefit financially from misinformation. Many of these individuals have make their money having outlets, whether it's books or blog posts or podcasts or whatever, that are directly funded by supplement industries. So what they did during this panel is they demonized Big Pharma, they demonized Big Food, but then they talked a big game about, quote, big wellness and big organic food without calling them that, right? And this is the sort of playbook that we've seen over and over and over. Why would you trust the the kind of mainstream individuals who have, you know, the FDA and the CDC have their boots on their necks when instead you can trust the wellness industry mm-hmm. because they have the real answers, Right. And the reason that they're able to tell you what's real is that the FDA isn't, you know, tying their hands behind their back. And this is really the basis for the Make America Healthy Again movement, deregulation. Mm-hmm. It's just about going in and deregulating, deregulating, deregulating. The funny thing is <laughs> when we – we are already quite deregulated when it comes to alternative medicine. But when we start to deregulate legitimate medicine – that's when the pseudoscience is no longer compartmentalized. It now bleeds its way into the legitimate medicine game. Yeah. yeah. And big pharma, the very, quote, industry, and I'm saying that in, in, you know, air quotes, big pharma, the industry that they are so angry with is going to start peddling pseudoscience. Totally. They're happy to be deregulated. It's like, oh, we could sell crap. We don't have to research and charge mm-hmm. up the wazoo for it. Sure. Mm -hmm. We're all in. This is not Mm -hmm. an anti-Big Pharma bill. It's a pro-quackery, pro-snake oil movement. That's what it is. Yep. Deregulation will hurt so many people. Mm -hmm. People will die. They are dying. They are dying and they will continue to die. And very often the people that will die are women and children, individuals of color, LGBTQIA individuals, people who are vulnerable. Yeah, and low socioeconomic status. Yep. Absolutely. And so now I guess we should talk a little bit about fluoride. I don't want it to take up the whole thing because we have covered it in the past. But basically, RFK Jr. is touting lines from 
Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> like, and I think, you know, it's the argument is that fluoride, I've got to find his quote I, because I, I got it right here. You got it right here. Yeah. He, oh, oh, here, I have it too. Okay. He, he described fluoride as an heart. industrial waste. Industrial waste associated with arthritis, bone fractures, bone cancer, IQ loss, neurodevelopmental disorders, and thyroid disease. And then in an interview just this past Sunday, Trump said that the idea of doing away with fluoridation, quote, sounds okay to me. Mm -hmm. And so, Steve, you did a really great job of going through each of the things in that list and debunking. You know, we know that although some fluoride is produced through industrial processes, it is not industrial waste. And it doesn't matter. It's like one of those, it's and a it chemophobia thing. Because at is. the end of the day, it completely dissociates into fluoride ions. That's it. It's a fluoride right. ion. It's an element. It doesn't right. matter. It's like saying this well, hydrogen yeah. atom came from poison. Who cares? It's now a proton. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. It doesn't matter yeah. where you sourced it from. It's, that's yeah, just, just fear-mongering chemophobia. That's what that of is. Of course, but yep. that's, that's totally from the playbook, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's from all of the rhetoric. Arthritis, bone fractures, bone cancer, IQ loss, neurodevelopmental disorders, and thyroid disease. You do a great job of going through and saying, okay, this was this one study, or this was when you know the levels that were looked at were you know X number of times greater than any acceptable level by the FDA. And time and time again... What we have seen. It's the EPA, that... actually. But Oh, thank you. Yeah, because the flu fluoride is naturally occurring in water, and, and the yeah. U.S. has so locations with it. high levels of fluoride. The EPA sets limits. If it gets higher than that, we actually reduce the level of fluoride. We yeah. only add it up to a very tiny amount that's well below anything that causes any issues. Doses. And by the way, again, this is a decision that's made at the local level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are states in this country that don't, or I guess I should say cities within states in this country, that don't fluoridate the water. 72.3% of the U.S. population has access to fluoridated water, according to the CDC. And the CDC calls fluoridation one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century because fluoridated water helps with oral health. It reduced cavities and tooth decay by 60% in the Grand Rapids experiment in 1945, where the first efforts to fluoridate water began. It mm -hmm. was such a resounding win that other jurisdictions decided to do this because the evidence was overwhelming. Yeah, and it saves money. And then they say, well, okay. we have, with fluoridated toothpaste, you don't really need it these days. But when they take it away, tooth decay goes up. Right. So clearly we do. Right. Because, of course, when we democratize something like fluoride in the drinking water, everybody has access to mm. it, as opposed to requiring it to be viewed. I mean, I hate to say this because it shouldn't be a luxury item. It should be a necessity item. But for some people, it is a luxury item. And for some people, they just don't have access to the oral hygiene that they need. Maybe they're using fluoridated toothpaste, but they're not brushing their teeth multiple times a day. Maybe they don't have an opportunity to go to the dentist and use the fluoride that they give to children at the dentist. Well, this is what we're headed for. It's really, really scary. Yeah. And that's just one of, you know, the ACA, fluoridated water and vaccines. That's just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. There is so much pseudoscience that RFK has peddled. And when you, again, look at the things that were covered by the panel, that's sort of like a good early taste of what we could be up against. All of the wellness industry bullshit that they were peddling, it really, really scares me. Just so much pseudoscience yeah, and just outright it's lies. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kara. All right, Bob, I understand the moon Miranda has water and maybe something else. Uh, perhaps. We may, tentatively, perhaps, maybe have yet another <laughs> icy moon in our solar system with a subsurface ocean. And we know what that means, right? First, my first thought is like, oh, maybe there's chemosynthetic life. life in there. Uh, but that's definitely jumping the gun. Uh, the mm. moon, though, doesn't orbit Jupiter or Saturn, but mm -hmm. the far more distant and less well-branded planet, Uranus. How could such an interesting oceanic possibility be teased out of such a distant small object. Uh, the study published in the Planetary Science Journal, led by Tom Nordheim, planetary scientist at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. So this starts with Uranus, uh, the second farthest planet at 19 AUs. That's um, 93 million miles, the distance of Earth to the sun. Jupiter is only five AUs. 
So this is like a lot farther away. Um, this is the planet that rotates on its side. You know, that one giving it crazy seasons like uh, at the poles, it's 42 years of sunlight and then 42 years of darkness. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, that's nasty. The star of the study, so to speak, is Uranus's innermost moon, Miranda. The moon is tiny. It's got a surface area of, of Texas. Texas is big, but it's small for, for a moon. With a diameter of only 470 kilometers, it's one of the smallest observed objects in hydrostatic equilibrium in our solar system. If, if it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, that means that it is, it is round because of gravity. Mm. Ah, like the moons of Mars are not round. Right, right. Depending, of course, what it's made of. But, you know, they're rocky moons. So how do we go about determining that there might be water under the ice on a moon that's 2.7 billion kilometers away? Call the water Um, company. Yes. Uh, Another option would be to, uh, (laughs) well, in this case, it's it's ironically about what's on the surface of the moon. And we first got a look at Miranda from the pictures Voyager took way back in 86. Wow. Wow. It looks like a patchwork of different moons that got stitched together. It's really kind of bizarre. There's like these these grooves or canyons that are 12 times deeper than mm-hmm. the Grand Canyon. And there's these huge cliffs. And there's these weird trapezoidal shapes, geological shapes called coroni. They think it just be it might be dense, you know, metallic or rocky material from previous uh, collisions with meteors. Clearly, Miranda has a strange and complicated geological past. So, to reconstruct that past, the researchers combined the old with the new. They used the old Voyager pictures, and because that's really the best image, images that we have of Miranda, um, even though it's you know some eighty six. I mean, Voyager got pretty damn close, and we incorporated those old pictures into modern modeling techniques. Nordheim described it as squeezing the last bit of science we can from Voyager 2's images. So how does the surface of Miranda shed light on its interior? Uh, They say in their paper, in this paper, we will attempt to constrain Miranda's interior structure from interpretation and modeling of surface stress patterns. So the researchers claim that by determining what caused these those weird deformed surface geological shapes and structures, um, they they will be able to winnow the possibilities of what the interior of Miranda is like based so based primarily on the surface. Uh, now, the model showed that uh, or concluded that 100 to 500 million years ago, Miranda could have had a subocean, a subsurface ocean more than 100 kilometers deep. So now, how do you actually create an ocean on a small moon so far from the sun? Uh, the most likely culprit, they think, are orbital resonances with nearby moons, um, these are really fascinating. Resonances like this are like pushing a kid on a swing. You know, you're, the kid's swinging and you push at the right at the time and you, it, the kid goes farther and farther and farther. Orbital resonances are like that. The tidal forces between the moons of, of uh, Uranus can be amplified by these resonances to the point where the moons actually experience a change in their orbits. And that's why Miranda's orbits uh, inclined a bit. Uh, they think, but it's not only the uh, the orbit that changes because of these resonances. You can ch- it can change the axis of rotation itself and the tilt of its axis. Um, so it so it just wreaks havoc with, with these moons, these these resonances when they line up, you know, when when they're when they're properly set up. So this can also obviously wreak havoc on the moon's surface. And they calculated uh, that the, all of this resonance movement and stuff actually compressed one side of the moon and stretched the other side. And that's probably one of the main reasons why we're seeing such a weird, a weird surface going on there. Now, all of this also creates friction and heat in the interior, and that's what they think could have created the ocean there. So it basically kind of almost boils down to tidal forces again, mm-hmm. um, that which is what we see in the, the in the moons of Jupiter as well. We've got moons that uh, some of the most volcanically active moons around Jupiter are because of the tidal forces are just constantly kneading and compressing the interior. So kind of, it's kind of related to what we're seeing here although these, uh, these resonances are a little bit different. So how can that ocean still exist, though, after a half a billion years? Because this happened, you know, 100 million to a half a billion years ago. How, why is this, this ocean still there? So they say that, that one reason is that this tidal heating could persist, persist because of this uh, eccentric orbit. Uh, that that the moon is now in. Now, they're not saying that the, the ocean is still, you know, 100 kilometers deep. They say it's probably smaller, but it's it's probably still there. And the other bit of evidence for that is that um, if it were frozen solid, if the moon, 
had no subsurface ocean, they say that there there would have been evidence of that on the surface, and they do not see that evidence. So so that's basically the gist of their argument. In the future, they may be able to more definitively demonstrate uh, that Uranus still has a subsurface ocean. That would be very cool. I mean, I don't think. I mean, this is so far away. I mean, imagine three times farther away than Jupiter. I mean, I don't think we're going to be getting there anytime in our lifetimes at all. But uh, but. Maybe someday we will, we will be able to say that this is one subsurface ocean that not only exists, and like I said at the beginning, perhaps if there's a subsurface ocean, there could potentially potentially be some sort of of life, some you know, uh, single celled organisms, some microorganisms that are that are based on the chemo, you know, chemosynthetic rather than photosynthetic, and that would be of course mind boggling. But actually, I hope I'm hoping that we'll find that nearby. Uh, with Saturn and Jupiter, not have to go all the way to Uranus, but right, we so see. much closer. Yeah, one more thing to keep an eye on. Yeah, but I'm not yeah. going to be a probe there anytime soon. No, which is the, the the process they went through to to model this and come to that conclusion was was different and fascinating to yep. me. Yep, no probing of Uranus. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Evan, what's the Club Twenty Seven myth? Have you heard of this before? No. No. Wow. Yes, I yes. think you. I think yes, maybe you have. you have, but you don't know it as the Cl- uh, yeah. Club Twenty Seven Myth, or or what they call the Twenty Seven Club. That's for short. But um, this is a cultural phenomenon referring to a group of famous musicians initially, and then artists and some other actors who got folded into this group, who have all died at the age of twenty seven. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like Kurt Cobain. Right, right, right. But but Kara, it didn't start there. It's not a modern phenomenon. Oh, right. Janis Joplin, too? Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. dates back to – actually, the first one was 1969. That was when I was born. And Rolling Stone's co-founder, Brian Jones, he dies at age 27. He drowned. It was tragic. And the rock world was stunned by that loss. But then in 1970, Kara, Janis Joplin, mm. also at age 27, died – and Jimi Hendrix, age 27, dies in 1970. So, all right, you got Brian Jones, 69. Now Janice and Jimmy are gone in 1970, all age 27. And then one year later, 1971, Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors. Yeah, he was 27. Dies at age 27. Nice. In the club. Holy crap. What is going on with our music stars dying at age 27? Is it some kind of curse? But regardless, forever there it was, cemented in our culture. If you were a fan of any kind of music growing up in the 70s, even the early 80s, my guess is you have some kind of memory of discussions about the 27 Club phenomenon. And then what started happening is people started taking a peek back in time before the club was realized. And you'll find out that legendary bluesman Robert Johnson, he was age 27 when he died. So that yeah, you add that big name to the club. Going forward, like you said, Kara, Kurt Cobain from Nirvana in the 1990s. Amy Winehouse, also age 27, in the 2011, she passed away. And so you wind up casting sort of this larger net because you wind because what people will do is they'll start throwing actors and artists and other media people effectively into this more and you get more relevant data points. So what do, what do our brains do? Well, we like to uh, soak up these types of celebrity-related cultural phenomenon and accept them sort of as, I don't know, like a quasi-fact or fact-ish sort of thing that exists. And maybe you think, wow, what are those odds? All these amazing musicians and artists and celebrities dying at age 27. What are those chances? Are we really capable of knowing and understanding what those actual chances are with st- statistical significance? Probably not. But this has been studied before. I went back to an article from over at Vox from 2015, and there was research done that year uh, by a professor of psychology and music at the University of Sydney. Her name was Diana Theodora Kenny. And the most common age of death for musicians was not 27 in her study. Do you want to guess what the age was most common death for these artists? 68. 69. Bob's a little closer. 67. Uh, 56. 56 was the age. That's because yeah. musicians live hard. 11, 000, over 11,000 musicians were in, in that study, and she studied people who died between 1950 and 2010. Only 1.3% of those musicians died at age 27, 2.3% were the most 
at age 56. So yeah, and and if you, she grafted on a uh, on a chart, it makes a very nice you know bell curve statistically speaking. But regardless of that and other studies, this continues to be a subject of revisiting and more studies, but in different ways. And this is where I, we ran into the news item this week. It's being covered by a lot of places, but uh, Scientific American, and her name is Rachel Newer, N U W E R. She wrote an article about this titled The Myth That Musicians Die at 27 Shows How Superstitions Are Made. Yeah. And she's referring to a new study that appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. P-N-A-S. Uh, yeah. titled, titled, all right, bear with me here. Path Dependence, Stigmergy, and Mimetic Reification of the Formation of the 27 Club Myth. Uh, with authors Zachary Donovan and Patrick Kaminsky. What they were trying to do here is basically get into how a legend or a myth that emerged out of random but strange series of events went on to have a real-world impact by shaping the legacies of other famous people who subsequently died at age 27. In effect, they're saying, yeah, it's a myth, but there is maybe something going on here uh, that is of some significance. And what they did is they looked, they used Wikipedia and they looked at various languages, obviously throughout the world. And they used an analysis of people who were born after 1900 and who died before 2015. And they came up with over 344,000 Wikipedia pages, but then they used page visits as their proxy for fame, right? So this is based on that. So they put that model together, and do you know what happened when they looked at it, and as far as looking at all the artists who died at age 27, was it a, was it a significantly different number? Was, there, was it the same? What do you guys think? I don't know. It was different. the same. It was the same. Yeah, That's why we didn't know. It was the same. That did not change. But here's what they did find. They said among those in the 90th percentile of fame and higher, for those that did die at age 27, they experienced an extra boost of popularity in the form of more page visits to their Wikipedia page that could not be accounted for by other factors. They say the effect was particularly pronounced for the most famous of the famous or individual, individuals who roughly achieved the 99th percentile of fame. And that bump, they say, indicates that people who die at age 27 are considerably more likely to be more famous than comparatively those who even die at just age 26 or 28. So that's confirmation bias. I suppose so. That's what that right? is. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah so you have like people underestimate how many potential m musicians there are, right? Especially mm -hmm. if you include celebrities. It's thousands and thousands. You could come up with the same kind of number of people who die at any age, and there's a bell curve, you know, that has nothing to do with the age 27. That's just mm -hmm. a, you know, people notice a pattern and then they include the data in subsequent formulations. You know what I mean? They, they carry right. that quirky observation forward. And then, especially then you, just, then you engage in confirmation bias, you're looking for data to, to fit the pattern and without looking at all the data. It's just classic. You know, this is why even if like we see this same phenomenon happen even like in the clinic where you, by coincidence, see a couple of patients with some kind of a correlation – and say, oh, maybe there's something here. So you, you look to see for if there's other cases, and you find them, and you include the original observations in the data, and you have a case series that makes it seem like something's happening. It's all just random quirkiness that has nothing right. to do with anything. You need an independent, thorough evaluation with new data to see if this holds up. And, of course, it doesn't. It's just random nonsense. Correct. All right. Thanks, Evan. Jay, yep. it's Who's That Noisy Time? All right, guys. Going back at least two episodes, here's the noisy that I played. You guys have any guesses? Yeah, it's Donald Duck uh, maneuvering inside of a tank. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> I got s so many good Good guesses, meaning ones that I thought you know just were worthy of, of of that sound. The first one was from Joe Vandenenden, and he says, "Is that the Walker bringing the spacecraft carrier, the Europa Clipper, back out of the launch pad?" 
very cool guess. I mean, yeah, I could see that. I hear what you're saying there, and I think that's a great guess. You're not correct, and I would like to actually hear that sound if you ever can get it. Another listener named Matthew yeah. Morrison said, Hi, Jay, my daughter Neve, and I think it is a ship moving through the water where there is a layer of ice on top that is breaking as the ship moves through it. Another fantastic guess because there are water-like sounds going on in that clip. So, you know, I think that was a pretty cool guess. You are incorrect and tell Neve no big deal. Everybody tries. It's great to try. Sometimes we actually win, right? So keep trying. Next one is Matt. Soskins, and he said, Jay, great to meet you at PsyCon. Before I give you my guess, I want to tell you about my grandmother's brownie recipe and how it led to me <laughs> led me to know this noisy, and then, oh, he's, of course, he's kidding because I asked people, you know, please don't write me these big stories. Just cut, <laughs> cut to oh, the chase. <laughs> and then he said, water-powered organ or a bird. Now, whenever anybody says, or a bird, I just <laughs> ignore that. <laughs> because, of course, I, you know, I, I shouldn't even be taking guesses from people with more than one guess, but I, it was a joke. I get it. Water-powered organ. It is not a water-powered organ, but again, there is, you know, there is a water kind of noise in there, and I, I can see where he's coming from. Next one is from Ben Simon. He said, this week's noisy puts in mind movie scenes of nervous naval officers quietly glancing at each other during a tense submarine dive. So I'm going to say this is a recording of a record-breaking deep dive by a research uh, submersible. Another awesome guess. It's not correct, but damn, that's an awesome guess. But there was no winner this week, and that's perfectly okay. Like I said, you know, we try, sometimes we fail. What did Yoda say? Try or do not, there is no fail, right? Remember? Do or do not, there is no try. Right, that's it. Uh, well, that's not, that does not apply to who's that noisy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I want to thank it. everybody for being honest, because since nobody won... That means I'm 100% sure that everybody that listens to this show that sent in a guess respected my request to not write in if you knew the answer, because I knew a lot of people knew the answer out there. So you know what? Props to you guys. More more reason to go to Nauticon, because we have high-quality people that listen to this show. So guys, what is that sound? I was really excited to hear it after I knew what it was, and then I listened to it, and it ended up being as cool as I hoped it should be. Okay, this is the sound of molten metals swirling in the Earth's core what? as its magnetic field flips. Can't record that. The tape recorder would melt. Yeah, that's what I thought. No, but that, guys, that is the internal swirling sound of the Earth's core. And it made me think of something really interesting, and, and luckily it's not the case. Imagine if we constantly heard that noise. But that noise is, you know, think about how loud that noise must be. It just can't penetrate all the rock and regolith and everything. But I just thought Wait. that was a wicked cool noise. Let's listen to it again. That's loud. I still hear Donald Duck in there a little. There's a Boat Creek noise in there. It, so I, I get all those uh, guesses. Jay, you mentioned as the magnetic field flips. Wait, what, is, what does that mean? I guess they were recording it in, in anticipation of the flip. I don't think it has anything to do with the flip, oh. but that's why they were recording. Um, and before I move on to, to the new Noisy for this week, I have a response uh, to something that we talked about. You know, Kara was mentioning that, let me see, back in episode 1007, um, we heard the voice of both Helen Keller and her interpreter. Kara commented on how strange it, it is to hear the accent that was used by the interpreter whenever recordings from that time period are played because nobody speaks that way anymore. And then Kara speculated that that's probably just how people spoke back then, but it sounds affected. So I, a couple of people wrote in about this. Um, this particular email is from someone named Stephen Hopkins, and he says um, it's ap it absolutely was affected as it was manufactured, it was a manufactured accent which did not evolve organically. It's called Mid Atlantic accent or the Transatlantic accent. And it was a basically, it was a put on accent uh, by Northeastern American upper class in the early 20th century. And it was adopted by many broadcasters and actors of that time period uh, because it made them sound cultured and because they felt it helped their voice come through more clearly. Okay, so. The voice is BS, right? It, it, yeah, it's it an was affectation. Well, we've spoken yeah. about this. We before absolutely the have the mid, the mid Atlantic we accent. Do. What's yeah? What's interesting about it is that it does, it's not a regional accent. Like it doesn't exist anywhere. It is a a learned accent. It's taught like in finishing school or whatever, and it is essentially like an Eastern um, American accent with some British affectations and you know and, and mixed in like. 
British sounds mixed in. And so, and it is supposed to be a very, like you enunciate things very clearly and you, you know what I mean? Like, but it's it, also got this like high and mighty sound to it. Yeah. It's right. Really exactly. But the thing is, so, and, and so that person might not have been speaking that way because she was being recorded. She might have been speaking that way because she was educated at one of the schools who taught her to speak that way. And maybe she did lay it on a little bit thick because she was being recorded. We don't know because everyone has their own individual manifestation of like what their mid-Atlantic accent is. But that doesn't mean there isn't also temporal accents because if you watch documentaries of like, I watched a lot of World War II documentaries and you watch people in the 40s being interviewed on mm-hmm. film and they're not actors and they're not, you know, they're you know not upper class affectations. They speak in an accent that doesn't exist wow. today, you know? It's like the, that's right, yeah. Johnny. Yeah. Like that <laughs> the war, of, Rafa. They, yeah. it's, not, that's, it's not that exactly. It's like that's kind of a stage accent. but is roaring along. Meh, <laughs> see? Meh. Yeah, the, <laughs> meh. But that's what that's when you that's when you hear like what real people sounded like at the time because they're not actors they're just people in the war you know or whatever, so there is absolutely temporal accents as well. But I, I do agree that that person's accent was probably a learned, you know, transatlantic yeah. or mid. I really accent. don't like it. it. It sounds so put on. You know, it, does. it, it sounds, sounds like snobby. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just don't right. Like it it yeah. was snobby. It was literally yeah. snobby. I mean, that was kind Roger of Roger that, and it just sort of faded away after World War Two. All right, so good job, everyone, that sent in all those great guesses. Mm. I have a new noisy for you this week. Check this out. There you go. That's a ready whip whip cream. Being <laughs> yeah, we know that. Like it's like you know, eleven o'clock at night, and you get it in the refrigerator. That you know, <laughs> yeah, that's straight into the mouth. Yeah, that is like that's a rite of goddamn passage in the United States. Oh, we should all take one tonight. So, um, okay, guys, if you know this week's noisy, or if you heard something really cool, email me at wtn at the dot org. All right, so let's go on with that interview with Brian Cox and special guest Brian Wecht. And for those premium patron members, uh, you get to listen to the full uncut version of that interview. That'll be up this weekend. Well, joining us now is Brian Cox. Brian, welcome to the Skeptic Sky to the Universe. Ah, pleasure. Pleasure to be here. You are one of the people that we've been hoping to get an interview with for a very long time. You are obviously one of the superstar science communicators in the world. We really appreciate what you do. Uh, so we were talking about you know, the, making the transition from being basically an academic, a scientist, to being a science communicator. How, how has that worked out for you? How do you feel that, about that? Well, I mean, I, the first thing to say was an accident. So I didn't really plan it. Um, in, in fact, for, in my early career as a, a PhD student and then postdoc, what all I tried to do was get a research fellowship so no one would bother me and then just do research. And I didn't even want to teach. Right? I just wanted to avoid everything about, apart from doing particle physics. And then uh, we, we, I got involved in um, one of the sort of funding crises that happen every now and again in all, sort of, all countries, I think, mm. in, in the UK. So I began to get involved in arguing for more funding for research. And that brought me into contact, I suppose, with the media and the, and the press. And so it was an accident, really. And then, and then the, the BBC in the UK uh, interviewed me a few times and then said, why don't you make a little documentary on the radio about particle physics? And then why don't you make a little TV show, a little low-budget thing about particle physics? And mm-hmm. and so it, it happened by accident. And now, I mean, I, I, I love teaching. So now I choose to teach at the University of Manchester. I teach first years, quantum mechanics and relativity, actually. Wow. And, and I And I... Obviously, as you've said, I get involved in making television programs and so on. So it was uh, it was something that I came to later in my career. But I very strongly believe that it's uh, a, a, an important part of an academic career if you choose to mm-hmm. do it. And in fact, I was at the University of Manchester last week. We had a big um, sort of worldwide uh, universities conference there. And I spoke at that and said that I think it's extremely important that if academics want to engage in whatever capacity it doesn't have to be making television programs but just in 
speaking about climate science, as we've spoken about today, for example, then that should be seen as not only positive, but it should be part of an academic career if the academic chooses for it. So promotion case and so on. And so I, I've come to believe that it's extremely important, of course, now to, to engage. And we can talk about why the, all the reasons why I think that's the case. Yeah, obviously, I completely agree with you. Also, being an academic myself, I, I'm always curious asking my fellow sort of academic science communicators, how's that going for you? So, and how specifically, how does the university, do they agree with you that this should be part of an academic career and that you get credit for it for promotion? Mm. And I know there's a little bit of a divide. I think it's worse in the U.S. than in, in yeah. the U.K. Yeah. So what is, what's your experience been? Yeah, at the University of Manchester, actually, we have a, uh, we, so we have the promotion, the, the, they call it the legs of the promotion case, right? and, and they are uh, research, teaching, administration, and we call it social responsibility. Okay. We, so, so we have the so it's a quarter basically of the case mm. it can be, which is public engagement as we might call it. So, but I think it depends very strongly on your vice chancellor, the head of the president of the university, but also. Uh, and I spoke about this as well, this conference last week. It can often be that, that I do find that the people right at the top are very, that they understand, right, as I think we all understand, that it's vitally important mm -hmm. to communicate science. Of course, in a, in a democracy, as Carl Sagan said, the idea that you have a, if you have a population that has no contact with the way that we acquire mm -hmm. reliable knowledge about the world, then the decisions that democracy makes will be flawed. Right? So, yeah, yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. And I think people at the top know that. Mm -hmm. You can have problems in universities with uh, the kind of middle management, <laughs> the heads of department level and things like that, mm. you know, because of the funding streams and so on. So I think that's where the, in, in the UK, if there's going to be a problem, it will be with your kind of line manager. It right. won't be with yeah. the, the people at the top who understand the wider picture. Brian, I talk a lot about particle physics on the show. And I want to get your sense of how you feel about your um, confidence in the future. You know, you've got the LHC, who's they've scaled up now to, what, 14 tera electron volts. And the Higgs boson is still, like, the biggest thing that they've done. They've, they've made a lot of discoveries. But how is your optimism in the future for being able to reveal some new physics beyond the standard model? What, do you think we'll ever, in, in a reasonable amount of time, get to a regime in it where we can discover new physics? Or is it probably forever beyond technology that we could build and finance to discover? Is it just too far beyond us for a long time now? It's a very good question. And the answer is, for the first time in the history of particle physics, we don't know. Um, right. and it's a little so, scary, no. right? It's a little yeah. scary. I mean, so, so the LHC, I should say, it was, it was, why was it built at that energy? It was built at that energy because we knew that the standard model without a light Higgs bro broke down, mathematically speaking, at those energies. So what that means in, in reality is you either discover a Higgs boson of some kind or, or some other mechanism. Right. And in fact, the, the, well, I worked on physics without a light Higgs at the, at the LHC before we turned the LHC on. So signatures, uh, was, the model breaks down. Um, one of the places it breaks down most obviously is in the scattering of W bosons, for example. So you can bang W bosons together. WW scattering is called. Yeah. And if you if you calculate that process without a Higgs boson in the theory, then it it, it gives you nonsense basically. Energies of a uh, actually 1.4 TV, right? So, so so well within the scope of the LHC. Right, right. So that's why you could you could with absolute confidence build that machine. Because you knew you were going to right. discover something. It's also true to say, many of my colleagues who've been in particle physics longer than I have would say, but it's also true that most of the machines that we built discovered things they weren't built to discover. Right. 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 So, so there's all, sure. you know, so, but, but at least you knew there was an energy threshold, which was within the scope of that machine, that you'd see something. Right. And justify the and, billions of dollars spent. Is yeah. That... Now, you're absolutely right now that, that at the moment... With LHC, we're in a. It's it's exciting that we're in a precision physics regime. So we're still looking for, obviously, new particles. M most people, I, I think, would have put money on supersymmetry. Yeah. Super that, super right. that, that was my field. When yeah, I was yeah, yeah. Theory, string I, theory yeah. it comes out of string theory. It's, it, 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 it's there. I'm sure that, that nature is supersymmetric at some it seems, scale. It seems very plausible, right? But, and also plausible that the LHC might have seen some sure, super, but nothing yeah, from the LHC. Too, but like nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Um, so you're right that what do you do? I mean, it's true that it, 
particle physics goes in phases where you then go into a precision measurement phase like the, the accelerator before it lep in the same tunnel yeah, yeah. you know we, we were making high precision measurements on the w and z bosons and that that get was necessary information so you you kind of go to a higgs factory type model for example if there's nothing else you start making yeah. high precision measurements on the higgs which is what we're doing with the lhc yeah. at the moment with the upgrades mm. um while still looking for new signatures so, so we know that there's, it's not complete, right? We, we know that yeah, the standard that, model, but we don't know where the energy scale is. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we don't know how big to make the next one. Is that basically the answer? Yeah. In other words, so, but it's not just big; it's the type. So you could do yeah. a muon collider or yeah. something like that. True. If you're going to do a, a baryonic promising. collider, then that looks promising. You'd have to yeah. just scale it up, but you can do lots of other stuff. Yeah. Well. Oh, you, I mean, so the but then again, having said all that, I'm a strong supporter of the. The, the the big machine, whatever whatever it's currently called, that CERN want to build the super LHC, yeah, which, which is a hundred kilometer tunnel, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, design. amazing. But. Because because what you do find is that, and we I saw it firsthand with LHC, is that there aren't many people who know how to build accelerators on that scale, and they're really difficult, and you can yeah. forget, you can lose the expertise, and it's hard. And actually, a lot of the sure. people who worked on the LHC were at the, towards the end of their careers. They're highly experienced people. And so I, I think there's a very strong argument that it, it's not a lot of money, actually. When you look at the, the – the, these are decadal projects. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 we're talking about the, the machine for 20, 30, 40, 50 years yeah. in the future. And so the, the level of you know a, a billion dollars a year or something in total, which CERN is – it, it looks expensive, certain, but, but actually its budget is less than my university, the University of Manchester. So its, it's, oh, wow. it's, it's yearly budget, out of which it builds the machines, is of a medium-sized university. It's, it's a lower budget than Harvard and Princeton and those universities. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. so, so I think at that level, the, the idea that the world has this capability to build these machines and builds one of them, and it takes decades to build them and then you operate it and do good physics with it mm. for 50 years is, is compelling to me. And, 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 you know, I'd put money on there being interesting stuff. It, it, it's not, you it's know, getting, theoretical physics. Yeah. It's, it, it, the, you get into problem if you don't it's see things. It's getting narrower that, and narrower. narrower right. As we yeah. Keep, right. So, right. So, but, but having said all that, as I said earlier, it is the case that we, we couldn't guarantee it knowing what we know yeah. at the moment. It, it does right. seem like, I mean, supersymmetry, the constraints are getting tighter and tighter for that, right? right? So who knows right. what's going to happen with that. But then you have something which is possibly related, although a priori, not necessarily, dark matter, where, right, if, that seems like a much more plausible discovery to me at some point in the nearer future. Yeah, sure, and the standard model that, doesn't say anything about that. So we need to go we beyond, know. we need to go beyond the standard we model. Know. That's right. And is that supersymmetry or something else? Right. I saw this very, there's a very cool, some work that I heard of the other day um, where, from string theory. So maybe you know where um, you, you're looking at the parameter space of string theory uh, and looking at the, this, you know, landscape of possibilities. Yeah. And then saying, I, I think it's true to say that if you go, if you take the cosmo cosmological constant, mm. which is what is it, 10 to the minus 122 yeah. <laughs> Planck yeah. units, right? It's a ridiculously tiny number. And you use that as the parameter that you don't know. You don't know why that's the case, but you use that. Yeah. I think there's some theories now that are suggesting that you could link that to dark matter Ooh. in the sense that you get it, it can be sort of slight largest extra dimensions about the micron scale mm -hmm. that are implied Ooh. by that low value of the cosmological constant, which and then you, the gravitons the, the tower of excited states of gravitons seem to have the right properties to be dark matter so it was, it was oh, the Vafa, Klein it, states it, from that or, yeah, yeah i heard it was actually it's on a yeah vafa was a is collaborator of mine right so yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's his work so i don't i don't know this work yeah land. so swamp land is kind of the, the there's a uh, I've been a while so i thought about this so i might be getting this wrong but there's a question of is everything that's possible out there described by some theoretical model or not yeah so is how complete or you know is your theoretical framework and he coined this term swamp land to yeah. mm. you know to ask what can we actually you know what's allowed in terms of the parameter space versus the actual theory yeah the so theory. it was it, it was i i think there's a review paper i haven't read it yet i was only made aware of it the other week so i i'm my, on the plane back tonight mm -hmm. I'm okay. like, yeah, <laughs> all right actually. cool New but it looks really fascinating so it's just an example of where this theoretical progress that uh, and string theory is a good example because I, 
get asked a lot, you know, that people tend to think, oh, it kind of went away, it kind of failed or so. But it's not. It's, it's not a, a tremendous all. amount it's, of progress. Yeah. And with holography as well, which is coming in there and ads yeah. and a link yeah. to the work, the tiny bit of research that I do into black holes. And then, then it, it, it does seem that we're on the verge of a, yeah. I think, a really exciting transformation. Yeah. The, 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 fundamental the way I have always explained it to people is I think the mm -hmm. original, so when string theory was first, you know, kind of out there in the, in the mid eighties, some very optimistic people said, you know, we're going to be, we're going to have the, you know, electron mass from, from first principles yeah. in 10 years, which was just wow. completely not true. Because what they wanted <laughs> is write down the theory, we get to a four dimensional universe with the standard model, and that's it. That's not true. That didn't happen. I think it's never going to happen. Yeah. But what string theory does provide is this tremendous toolbox that you can use to understand hard problems, yeah. like with holography. And right, people right. are using this all the time to study amazing things that we didn't have access to before from from a variety of standpoints. Is it a shut so, up and calculate kind of moment where it's like it works, don't worry about what it, it how it relates well, to reality? I, I think there I, I think that's a valid philosophy. I you know, what can we calculate with this that we couldn't calculate yeah. before? It's also valid to ask, and what does this mean for the real world? Right. Mm -hmm. Can you use these techniques to actually calculate anything useful? That is an open question right yeah. now. There are some people who are just really digging deep and trying to get the standard model out of st string theory. Even just getting the standard model with the right particles and masses right. and interactions, that's very, very hard to do. Guys, and, if we had, yeah. if we could just magically have these answers appear in front of us, right? The, what's the practicality behind it? Is the goal here to just understand how the world works or are there actual applications that people like me could relate to. Oh. Well, look what flowed from quantum mechanics. I mean, I'm not talking to you. Whole industries. I'm not talking to you. I want to well, talk to you about um, this. So, <laughs> so one of the fascinating areas, which I've been involved in a little bit, so I work with, I have a, a co-supervisor PhD student at Manchester who happens to be funded, by the way, by an information technology company but he's working on black holes and quantum information. Um, it, there, there's a direct link between the at least the techniques that have been developed to try to understand things like the black hole information paradox and the techniques you use to uh, build error correction codes, quantum computers, you know, to try to protect the memory from errors and so on. Oh, yeah. So it, if you'd have said, and I say this to funding agencies when I speak to them, if I'd have said to you, fund research into collapsed stars because that will help yeah. you build quantum computers yeah. and understand them, then they would have just laughed at you. Right, right. of course, of course. But it turns out that the skill sets... Yeah at least to the same and it, it could i mean basically you know it, it's not only that it, it, it is that this field of emergent space time which is very popular at the moment and where, where essentially what you have the simple way to say it is you have space time emerging from a quantum theory from quantum entanglement yep. of some yeah. objects yeah. which are probably uh, at the scale that uh, from the beckenstein entropy right the the, the scale of the, the you tile the event horizon to work out the entropy of a black hole it's probably we probably know the distance scales actually mm -hmm. it's probably string it's a string scale yeah. um but so the it, so the the idea that space-time is emerging from entanglement um that that that's becoming an experimental science now i, I find that's it amazing. interesting i find it fun hmm. the 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 use Probably the best use from a physicist's perspective of quantum computers, like the Google quantum computer mm -hmm. and Microsoft, is not actually as a quantum computer, but as a load of qubits. Because mm -hmm. they're really yeah. good arrays of qubits. That's not why they put, spent billions of dollars building the things. But if right. you're a physicist, you go, this is brilliant. I've got a load of qubits. <laughs> and there was a that? paper recently where there's this filament. I don't know you saw it. There's a, the, it, 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 so it's in a particular configuration of the qubits, a particular entanglement structure mm -hmm. of the network. You, you get something that you could interpret as a filament of space hmm. emerging. It, it's, oh, my God. It's, it's a, sometimes described as a one-dimensional wormhole. Right. right? So, yeah. But so that's a remarkable paper. It's not. Wow. It's, a, it's a published paper. You can look at it. There's some controversy about it, if that's the right interpretation of it. But I, it's sure. fascinating that quantum gravity is becoming an experimental science potential. We seem to be on the verge of that. For hmm. years now, too, the... I mean, a, another question that uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's nonsense, extra dimensions, right? Yeah, there's sure. a, uh, I don't know if they're still doing it, but for a while there was a group, the Adelberger group in Seattle, which was, so the idea is that if you have access to extra dimensions at very small scales, you'll see deviations from the inverse square law of gravity, yeah. right? Because the gravitational flux can spread into the extra dimensions. 
So what they were doing is they were moving things, you know, in, yeah. together in very tiny distance scales and checking for deviations from one over r squared. If there's one extra dimension, then it's one over r cubed, et cetera, et cetera. Oh my God. These are yeah. they, mm-hmm. if they had, you would know about right. it. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I would have talked about it. This is experimental <laughs> question. This paper from yeah. Baffert, I heard of that. I said I haven't read in detail yet, so I'll read it tonight. So, <laughs> yeah. But it, it does suggest that there the, the, the may be a large-ish dimension at the micron scale, which I, so it'd be interesting to see what yeah. the uh, Experimental because they can put bounds on it. it's like the number and size of the extra dimension. Yeah. Well, does that relate to the as an explanation for the weakness of gravity compared to the other fundamental forces? Is that like kind of leaking into these other potential dimensions? Is that where you were going with that? No, not quite. I mean, it's not totally unrelated, but it wouldn't be the same thing. Okay. Yeah, historically, that was a, a thought, wasn't it? Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I'm not sure. You know more than me in yeah. modern string theory, whether that's guys. Why that's why do string. physics change when you go smaller, but they don't change when you go bigger? Why do well, you, you know what I mean? Like you know, because we know that when you go when you get into a certain we got the you talk about quantum regime regimes and classical of validity, regime, right? Right. That you're asking why isn't there a new regime of validity? Yeah, like like if you if you just opened up, you made the scale tremendous. Would 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 our would concepts of physics change? Well, don't some people think that's exactly what happens, and that's why um, oh, that dark modify. matter is actually gravity behaving differently Mond, at the super. Mo- okay, so we, we have theories about about, well, about that, th- that. That's that's theoretically possible. I yeah. think that's a minority viewpoint. It's a minority it viewpoint. Is, it is. Yeah. 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 You 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 think dark matter is the answer to the observations, or are you even? Well, I don't. No, I mean we've operated under the assumption. That the thing is that the assumption that it's a weakly interacting particle mm-hmm. of some description, um, that fits quite a lot of things, including in particular the cosmic microwave background. Mm-hmm. It's, it's an important component of the way that the sound waves move through the plasma in the early universe before three hundred eighty thousand years after the Big Bang. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, so we have very good data there. And, and essentially what you're seeing, if you look at those pictures of the CMB, you're seeing sound waves mm-hmm. going through the plasma. Yeah, right. And, and the, the, wow. the presence of uh, some kind of weakly interacting particle in there, that, that, that not electromagnetically interacting, is, is, is a component of those fits that fit very well. And that fits also gravity rotation curves and all the things as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it's, it's a good model. But it's not to say it's right, because you know we, we'd, we'd have to it discover yet. what it <laughs> is. <laughs> right. But it does fit multiple different, diff, uh, independent phenomena that yeah. we see. Not only the gravitational phenomena, but also the CMB. And it tends to be the case, you said, when you modify general relativity, for example, it tends to be the case you can modify it and fit something, but you mess up a lot of other things. Yeah. It's quite difficult, isn't I, it? it, it oh, near impossible, that's actually. That's right. And it, I, mean, I think if you polled most working physicists now, they would, you know, there, for a while there was this wimp versus macho yeah, debate right. on dark matter. Oh, yeah. I think it, it seems fairly consistent that most people would say wimps at this point. Oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. Yeah. you could find some the wimps have people won. who want to, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> until we know, we know, right? Right, it's still, right. right. Anything right, right. is possible. But, but right the, 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 I find it, the, this idea, clearly dark energy is uh, even more perplexing, to right. say the least. That's right. Right. Certainly. Uh, yeah. uh, th- this idea that the, I find it fascinating that there may be a link between that and, of course, inflation, which looks similar, and this, the, 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 the fact that our universe is, not, is on the edge of stability. Mm-hmm. Because which we know from measurements of the Higgs mass and the top mm-hmm. quark mass and so on. So uh, I think there's quite a few of my colleagues you speak to think that maybe these things are related in some way. I mean, yeah. inflation looks, it's a very much a different energy scale. But then you've got the inflation, you've got the Higgs, which is not com- contributing to anything, it seems. This, <laughs> this scalar field that doesn't blow the universe apart. And then you've got dark energy that... I, I, it's, it's a fine balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I... That's the cutting edge at the moment. I think it's one of the most interesting fields in theoretical physics, trying Did, to understand if those things are the same. Maybe right. they're not all different. Yeah. Right. <laughs> does, does it feel to you that we're still missing something absolutely fundamental about the universe that you know is, is making it impossible for us to really understand what's I mean, going on? I mean, the, the example maybe you could talk as well is, is hologra- holography, I think. You know, ADS-CFT, yeah, yeah. The, which is an example of a holographic theory. That, I think, is is really radical. Mm-hmm. It's this idea that we can we can find dual descriptions of reality. You know, so, so we that toolbox surely is going to be. Yeah, the, the the rough idea is that a you can use a ten dimensional string theory 
uh, to describe essentially a four dimensional yeah. field theory. And we're in the regime where one problem gets hard, the other gets easy. So you can do uh, kind yeah. of geometrical calculations in the gravity regime to give you field theory data in the particle thing. And in very special supersymmetric cases, there's an exact dictionary between Okay, the mass of this baryon is the dimension of this operator. And, and the, you can get these really non-trivial matchings, you know, these crazy, like, irrational numbers that, you know, pop up yeah. very nicely in both. And it, it's it's a wild thing. It's people, there's no proof of it per yeah. se, but there's so much data to indicate that it's it's correct, that I think it has to be true. Now, does that help us describe our universe is another, another question entirely. Mm -hmm. right, one last but, question, yeah. guys. Who gets it? Will AI help this field in any way? It's a really, a, it's a question that gets asked a lot, isn't it? The, the, um, and it does, you know, in, in data analysis, then you'd have to say yes, right? Large data sure. sets and so on. Um, it, whether or not creating new physical, like asking chat GPT to mm -hmm. build a quantum theory of gravity, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> I, well, that, that's a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is to that. Have you tried but, plugging that in to see is, what it says? You can try. It, it won't do it. <laughs> Actually, a big thing, so I left physics about 10 years ago, and one of the big things that I see different that a lot my colleagues are doing is a lot of them are doing machine applying machine learning to complicated systems mm -hmm. to see what they can do. So it's not... So it's not AI in a. It's in not going to solve the problem. It's going to accelerate no, the research. That's right. And okay. It's, it's kind of like yeah. what I would say a good analogy is what AI did with protein fold. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Exactly. So it could speed so things up a lot. It's going to speed it things up that way. Okay. <laughs> so, Brian, tell us about your current project, the Horizons show that you're doing. Yeah. I, I've been doing these, uh, as you said, show. My, my friend, um, Robin Ince, comedian that I work with on, on the BBC, yeah. said, uh, you know, it's, it, you should call it a lecture. And then he says, not at those ticket prices, though. You can't call it a lecture. <laughs> <at those." laughs> so it, it is true. That, so I, I ended up developing this, this live show, which is big LED screens, basically. Uh, um, and then all, many of the concepts we've just discussed, actually. But, so it has become a, a show. And uh, we, it was built for arenas in the UK. So mm. we've done 14,000, 15,000 people in the O2 Arena in Wembley yeah, and things like nice. that. Yeah. Stadium cosmology. Yeah. Right? And, and, and so I, I've enjoyed doing it a lot. We've, we've done it. Over 400,000 people have seen the show across wow. the world in the last that, few years. That does make me feel good about humanity, and, that we yeah. can get that many yes. people yeah. to, to sit for a science show. 15,000 people listening to you yeah. describe a Penrose diagram. It's kind of strange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so just to finish it off, because we came to the, the, the U.S. actually very early on in the development of it. And it was just after COVID and we did some small places. And I just wanted to finish it off. So, so it, we're bringing it back in a at the end of April, start of May, to a, a few cities, yeah, LA, mm -hmm. San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Seattle, Portland, uh, yeah. and to to just, and it's just me really saying, I want to say goodbye to this, uh, it, this, this particular mm -hmm. show. And I'd like to do it here because we, we started here in a sense mm -hmm. uh, a long time ago and it's changed a lot. Where can people so, find dates and get tickets? There's, there's a website called briancoxlive.co.uk. It's .co.uk because I think Brian. <laughs> coxlive.com I don't know probably we couldn't get it so. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter does it so it's briancoxlive.co.uk <laughs> and the tickets are there and then um, you know we might try and extend it a bit and come to you know I, we, I've never done a show in Vegas for example mm -hmm. so I think we could just ask David Copperfield to move out for a night yeah. or something <laughs> yeah. and put it in there um, but yeah so. well Brian this has been awesome thank you so thank much you. for sitting down with us oh, thank you fantastic thank you yeah. thanks all right It's time for science or fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items or facts, two real and one fake, and I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake, because panel is the plural of skeptics, <laughs> or oh. the collective. All right, you guys ready? Three regular news items. Yep. Here mm -hmm. we go. Item number one, new research finds that higher penetration of weather-dependent renewable energy sources, wind and solar, on the grid does not increase vulnerability to blackouts and reduces their severity when they occur. Item number two, a recent study finds that coyotes are thriving in North America and, in fact, direct hunting by humans results in larger populations. 
And item number three, a population-based cohort study of preterm infants finds no significant economic or educational effects lasting into adulthood. Bob, go first. Okay, so wind and solar do not increase the vulnerability of blackouts. Um, yeah, that kind of makes sense. I I'm I'm think I'm just going to buy that, although I haven't read anything specific about that. Um, coyotes are thriving in North America, and direct hunting by humans results in larger populations. Uh, I don't know about that last bit. Let's, let's see. I did not even absorb this third one at all. Population-based cohort study of preterm infants finds no significant economic or educational effects lasting into adulthood. So basically being preterm has no side, bad side effects. Lasting into adulthood. All right. Tell me everything that you can say about these three for the first person going. <laughs> They're all pretty self-explanatory. All right. I'm going to say the wolves. The coyotes, you mean? Fiction. Wolves, coyotes. Wait, you said coyotes? It's coyotes, said yeah. wolves. Okay. I say that's fiction. All right, Cause Jay. Because I, I feel like it. This first one uh, about the higher penetration of weather-dependent renewable energy sources. It doesn't increase the vulnerability to blackouts and reduces their severity when they occur. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't think it would increase vulnerability. I think it, it I, but it, these are, you know, these are things that definitely need electricity and have a lot of wiring and everything. Yeah. So this is a really interesting thing here, Steve, because you're saying it increase, they do not increase vulnerability to blackouts. So there aren't more blackouts because of them. Right. And when they, and when blackouts do occur, they're less severe. Yeah. All right. I think that's science. That that just makes sense. It took me a while to parse through it because at first, for some, for some reason, I thought you meant during like a EMP or some some you know solar flare or something, but I was just mistaken. Okay. So that one to me, a hundred percent science. The second one: a recent study finds out that coyotes are thriving in North America, and in fact, direct hunting by humans results in larger populations. So why would direct hunting by humans result in um, larger populations? Maybe because they they're killing off the weak ones, and you know, is that that possibly be it? That one's a maybe. That doesn't seem to, to track with me. The third one, a population-based cohort study of preterm infants finds no significant economic or educational effects lasting into adulthood. Preterm infants. Okay, so does it matter like how early they are? Yeah, in- there's a cutoff. Okay, so preterm... To, to, to qualify as preterm. Can you tell me what the cutoff is? So if you're born before 37 weeks, you are considered preterm. Okay, so yeah, that's early. I wish I knew that. (laughs) That would change your answer? Nah, just saying it. (laughs) All right, so let's think about this. So if a baby comes out early, I would imagine that there's reasons why that happens, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with the baby. So then it comes down to, you know, I mean, guys, what I'm about to say, I am not an expert, right? I'm thinking... Off the cuff here, the baby's kind of nutrition changes. I don't think nutrition is a maximum a maximal problem here. I mean, there might be other things that the baby would be getting from the mother that could affect its development. And, you know, babies can't breathe until they hit a certain age range. So the baby would – that that could be a factor. It's This is a messy one. I think that today, with proper care, babies are okay if they're born – in Steve's preterm uh, time frame, but this whole thing about like you know hunting the coyotes, uh, I just something rubs me the wrong way. That one's a fiction. Okay, Evan. Well, uh, well, well. well. <laughs> All right, the grid and not increasing vulnerability to blackouts. I believe that, but this part about reducing their severity when they occur, I'm having a hard time understanding why that's the case. Why would it reduce the severity of the blackout? Yeah, I, hmm. I, I'm so I'm going to be interested to hear that one if that one turns out to be science. I have a feeling it's kind of fictiony. Coyotes, I have no idea. Thriving in North America, I don't know. And in fact, direct hunting by humans result in a larger populations. Why would that be? Because they cluster more, and then is that how that will work? Would work? Because it creates pockets? I don't know. I don't know about that one either. Uh, The last one, oh boy. Preterm infants, no significant economic. That one's like the one I know the least about. They're all fiction. Thank you. Okay. And Kara says. (laughs) Uh, Darn it. Automatic failure, but okay. No, that's not an automatic (laughs) failure. It's an automatic win. It's a forfeit. 
I'm going to use my get out of jail free card on this episode. Don't we all get one for the year? No. No. Um, all right. How about the preterm infants one? Um, I, I can't put my finger on it, but I think there's something there. There's maybe an educational effect that lasts into adulthood that they've found. So I'll say that one's the fiction. Okay, Kara. I think coyotes is science. Uh, they are thriving. They are everywhere, at least in LA. I think that there are many examples of what's called conservation hunting, where culls are done intentionally to maintain or even grow populations. I think it's about distribution more than anything, uh, because animals are not, you know, spread out evenly. I think that the weather dependent, so like wind and solar energy being in higher numbers, I don't think it would increase vulnerability to blackouts. I know that the problem was with the severity, reducing the severity when they occur, but maybe they're just faster to get online, you know, or maybe they're cheaper and easier to fix. Like who knows? So yeah, the one that's really, really bothering me is this idea because you said a study of preterm infants. So just because 37 weeks is the cutoff doesn't mean that we're not also talking about babies that are born at 25, 26 weeks. Babies that are born early do not have fully developed organs. They're sick. They need surgery. They undergo a lot of treatments. There is no way that that doesn't affect them economically well into adulthood. This one just seems impossible to be science. So I have to say that that's fiction. All right. So you all agree with the first one. So we'll start there. New research finds that higher penetration of weather-dependent renewable energy sources, wind and solar, on the grid does not increase vulnerability to blackouts and reduces their severity when they occur. You all think this one is science. And this one is science. This is science. Yeah, that's great. Now, this was part of the reason for this study was, I don't know if you guys remember the whole Texas blackout thing where they were uh -huh. blaming yeah. the renewable you know, resources on the grid when it was in fact, it was in fact the, the coal fire plants or gas plants that were going down. Uh, so what they found was that, yeah, that the renewable, having renewables, weather dependent renewables on the grid does not make it more vulnerable, even to weather based events, right? So even if there's a storm or whatever, it doesn't make it more likely for these sources of energy to go down than traditional sources. Um, and when a blackout does occur, the amount of people who lose power is less because this is a more distributed power source and they they do come back more quickly so yeah this is, it actually lends resiliency if anything to the That's grid great. yeah it's great i guess we'll just keep going in order a recent study finds that coyotes are thriving in north america and in fact a direct hunting by humans results in large populations bob and jay you think this one is the fiction evan and carrie you think this one is science and i guess the question comes down to how could directly hunting coyotes increase their population uh, this wasn't a call to increase their population this is like when you try to reduce the population by hunting them and, in, <laughs> and, and it backfired and it backfired yeah so this is science this is science <laughs> yes <laughs> this one is science because yeah this is all true what happened what they think is happening is that even in locations where they have very liberal coyote hunting laws, meaning like it's open season, like there's no restricted season, there's no limit on how many you can kill. And then with those populations actually over time increase. And the the reason why they think this is happening is that they're, you're, the hunters are disproportionately killing older coyotes. And then the younger coyotes have more resources and they have more pups. And so they're just <laughs> breeding more. And so essentially their conclusion was is that hunting is not an effective population control mechanism for coyotes. They just bounce right back in even bigger numbers. So we're disproportionately hunting older coyotes because they're I slower guess, and easier to kill. I guess they're easier <laughs> to kill, amazing. yeah. I, it must be, must be the case. Whoops. So they, this study also looked at a lot of other things. So coyotes also do, do not suffer when, they're, when their region overlaps with wolves. Um, mm -hmm. except for certain, that's very, that's regionally dependent, but in many locations, basically depends on food supply. They, they do fine even when they're competing with wolves, but they don't do fine if they're competing with bears uh, yeah, or pumas. Yeah, because coyotes and bears, I think, they oh both hunt, but they also scavenge. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a mixed effect when, when coyotes overlap with other, other predators, there's a decrease in 
prey availability, but the especially the larger uh, predators tend to leave behind carcasses that the coyotes can then scavenge. Yeah. So they actually increase their flute supply sometimes. So depending on a lot of variables, sometimes it actually increases the coyote population because now they have more scavenging you yeah. know, avail- ar- available. And bears and coyotes also scavenge um, their dar- uh, garbage, bump- mm-hmm. Ugh, garbage dump scavengers. Yeah. So they, yeah. they come into urban areas and take food. Yeah. But coyotes are a meso predator. Have you ever heard that term? They're in the middle. They're not small. They're not right. large. They're meso. And they're, like, they're, they're just thriving. They're just adapting really well to human civilization. Doing just fine. All right. All right. That means that a population-based cohort study of preterm infants finds no significant economic or educational effects lasting into adulthood is the fiction because they found significant economic <laughs> and developmental <laughs> effects and educational effects. Yeah, so they have lower rates of you know, enrolling in a university, graduating from a university with a degree. They have lower in- income. Uh, per year, 17% lower. Uh, so yeah, they, there are lasting effects. It's hard to tease out exactly what that might be. Is this due to just they're not as healthy or maybe the neurological development is delayed? Mm. And the que- the reason why this is an important research question is because clearly they are starting at, at a loss, you know, farther mm-hmm. back. They have, they have to make up ground. The How qu- early? The question is, do they eventually catch up or do they do their deficits persist? So this was, they were looking at 18 to 28-year-olds. They said they had followed them for, you know, That's a long time, like two couple decades. Yeah. Uh, so this is a long, long follow-up. How long, how did you define preterm? How, how many 37 weeks before 37, 37 or less. Or less. So some of them were a lot, yeah. Were a lot less, yeah. 37? 37 weeks. Off. Yeah. yeah. And that, what's, what's typical? 40? 40, what? 40? I was, so I mean, I was four weeks. I was a whole month premature. Yeah. But it sure, obviously, I, it yeah, gets worse the more premature you are. So they looked at, you know, like 34 to 36 weeks, 32 to 33, 30, 28 to 21, 24 to 27. And the effects got worse, you know, the uh, the more preterm you were. Yeah, so it wasn't I much should, for I, like, I you asked just more goddamn 36. Questions. You know, that. So 40 is the average, but a full-term baby is 37 or 37 plus um, up to 42. Yeah. So, but you know, the, but it is still true that with modern medical management, they do fine. But the you know they they are starting, you know, at at a deficit, and they don't quite make that up. At least not in the in their twenties. That sounds preterm sounds like a way too broad of a term. At least for this specific science fiction. Mm-hmm. But it was true, no matter how you <laughs> slice it. I was biased because I'm preterm and I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, but think of how much more awesome you would be. Bob, oh my gosh! <laughs> well, no, Bob. The... <laughs> no, 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 don't so me. Right, fighting for resources. You don't want to think space. about all that stuff. You were a twin. Twins also are at a deficit because they, your your twin was using up some nutritional resources. In the so room. you ever you overcame multiple obstacles. And there. our mother smoked when she was pregnant with all of us. Damn. Wow. And that takes a hit as well. And we were exposed when we were kids. We had literally takes smoke. a hit. So yeah. we did she sew. drink I'm too? Sewer. Yeah, she wasn't a drinker. <laughs> no, uh, my parents weren't drinkers. They were not drinkers, yeah. but they, yeah, they, they both yeah, smoked. Smoky. It's terrible. But I all that it. meth. Hated you know. it. Um, hated it, it. The worst thing about my childhood was having to deal with that. Yeah. The worst? Yeah. I was like this one annoying constant presence in my childhood. Otherwise, we had, I think our childhood was great. Oh, barely was a blip on my radar. No, I hated it. Totally hated it. All right, Evan, give us a quote. When you get in a tight place and everything goes against you till it seems as though you could not hold on a minute longer, never give up then, for that is just the time and the place that the tide will turn. Very comforting words from Harriet Beecher Stowe, yeah. American abolitionist and author from the 19th century and so key and critical to helping end slavery in America. Mm-hmm. Um, can't be understated how important she was overstated how important she was political change is a never-ending marathon right so keep this in mind folks uh, especially these days all right thanks evan yep well thank you all for joining me this week you're welcome steve thanks steve thanks steve and until next week this is your skeptic's guide to the universe skeptic's guide to the universe is produced by sgu productions 
dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. Thank you.